Hey guys, my name is Jessica Tung and I'm an honor student taking human physiology this semester. This is just a quick video exploring a facet of the endocrine system known as the HPA axis or the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. And we're going to take a particular focus on the role of the adrenal glands in the stress response. So as a quick review, remember that the endocrine system is the entire set of glands in the body that secrete chemical messengers called hormones into the bloodstream so that they can communicate with target organs that are some distance away. Therefore, the HPA axis is a series of events that occur when the body is faced with a stressor. So in that scenario, the hypothalamus will make and release CRH, or the corticotropin releasing hormone, which causes the pituitary gland to make and release ACTH, or the adrenocorticotropic hormone. That will then travel through the bloodstream to stimulate the adrenal glands to make and release stress hormones, the main one being cortisol. So let's take a second to talk about where the adrenal glands are found in the body. I've gone ahead and drawn this anatomical representation of our kidneys. Hopefully that's pretty obvious. And we have two adrenal glands, one on top of each kidney. And so if we break down the word adrenal, we get ad or above and renal, meaning kidney. So it literally means above the kidney. And if it helps, I kind of like to think of our adrenals as little kidney party hats. So we're going to zoom in and take a cross section of this adrenal gland here on the right to see how it's organized on the inside. Let me just scoot out here. So here I've pre-drawn this adrenal gland and I've sliced it down the middle. And as you can see, there are three obvious areas to the gland. This outer layer of connective tissue, this portion on the inside that I've colored a little lighter called the adrenal cortex, and this dark region in the center called the adrenal medulla. These two areas, the adrenal medulla and cortex, are both involved with the stress response in very distinct ways. So the first stage of the stress response is activated by our sympathetic nervous system. And the adrenal medulla is interesting because while it's innervated by the sympathetic nervous system, it actually releases the catecholamine hormones, epinephrine and norepinephrine into our bloodstream. These two hormones are responsible for the very intense, immediate, fight or flight response that is key for survival. But it's important to note that this is not what we're talking about when we're discussing the HPA axis. When we're talking about the HPA axis, we actually want to talk about the adrenal cortex, which is its downstream effector. The adrenal cortex plays a role in modulating our long-term energy metabolism in the wake of a stressor. And it does this by making and secreting glucocorticoids, which if you break down the word means glucose, cortex, and steroid. Otherwise, a steroid released by the cortex that will alter how our body metabolizes glucose. And typically, the main glucocorticoid produced is cortisol. And to point out something kind of interesting, I'm going to draw out the general structure of a steroid. And I want to point out that there is a huge size difference between these two types of molecules. Catecholamines produced by the adrenal medulla, the one I've drawn here is epinephrine, are much smaller than the glucocorticoids produced by the adrenal cortex. And although the size of the molecule doesn't necessarily have to do with their role in the stress response, I like to think of these catecholamines as small and fast. 
because the adrenal medulla is controlled by the sympathetic nervous system and therefore reacts very quickly to stress. On the other hand, glucocorticoids produced by the adrenal cortex take a longer time to enter the bloodstream, and so I think of them as slower, with longer lasting effects. And scrolling down now, we're going to walk through how these two regions of the adrenal gland function during the stress response. So let's say that we are exposed to some stressor, say a shark at the beach. The first thing that happens is the activation of your sympathetic nervous system, or what is classically known as the fight or flight response. And the effects of the sympathetic nervous system are very, very quick on the order of seconds. So during this time, your adrenal medulla is releasing epinephrine and norepinephrine. And this is able to happen so quickly because these hormones are already pre-made and they're stored in vesicles just waiting for the right release signal. And these hormones communicate with the rest of your body in order to deal with the immediate threat. Some of the effects of the fight or flight response include increasing your heart and breathing rate in order to supply more oxygen to your muscles. It also redirects blood from your digestive organs to your extremities, which will help you either fight or run from the threat. It also causes your liver to start breaking down its glycogen stores to supply the body with more glucose for energy. So the second stage of the stress response is the activation of the HPA axis. And as I said earlier, one of the primary effects of the HPA axis is modulating our long-term energy metabolism. And it's slower to activate than the fight or flight response. It's typically on the order of hours. And the reason why is that unlike the adrenal medulla that has hormones ready to go in vesicles, the adrenal cortex has to synthesize new cortisol every time it's activated. So it takes some time. We often see the HPA axis referred to as the, quote, resistance phase, and this is referring to its role in reinforcing that initial response by your sympathetic nervous system. And what I mean by this is that at some point during the fight-or-flight response, the glycogen stores in your liver will eventually run out, and you'll have to replenish that source of energy somehow. And so one of the roles of the HPA axis is to sustain your blood glucose levels, in order to support your central nervous system during stress. And the cortisol released from the adrenal cortex is able to do this in two different ways. First, cortisol inhibits the effects of insulin. Insulin is a hormone that is released after you finish a meal, and it allows the glucose obtained from your meal to enter your liver cells to be stored as glycogen. Cortisol opposes glycogen synthesis, and will keep the glucose in the blood for immediate use by other tissues, which is favorable during a stressful situation. The second way that cortisol sustains our blood glucose levels is by initiating liver gluconeogenesis, or the synthesis of glucose from non-sugar precursors. The raw materials for gluconeogenesis are supplied by amino acids from the breakdown of muscle, and fatty acids and glycerol from the breakdown of fats. Now, aside from increasing our blood glucose levels, cortisol also has a huge role in regulating our immune system in times of stress, and it does so in this sort of biphasic way. Towards the beginning of HPA axis activation, the low levels of cortisol boost our inflammatory response and increase our immune activity. This is very helpful for battling infections when we are in a vulnerable situation, say, escaping a shark that just took a bite out of your arm. Now, as cortisol levels increase over time, they actually start to have anti-inflammatory effects, which prevent our immune system from going crazy and attacking our own cells. So before I wrap up this video, I want to briefly talk about why this stress response, which has evolved over millions of years, is often detrimental to us today in modern society. Most of us these days aren't at the mercy of giant predators in the wild, but we are more prone to chronic stress or low levels of stress over long periods of time. And these high levels of cortisol can depress our immune system and leave us susceptible to infection. 
high levels of cortisol for long periods of time can also lead to insulin resistance, which essentially starves cells because they're not able to take in glucose from the blood. This will send hunger signals to the brain, causing you to overeat. And this, along with muscle degradation, can cause someone with chronic stress to gain weight and have a really hard time shedding it. So I hope this video was helpful in reviewing the HPA axis and the stress response, and I wish everyone good luck on the exam.